introduce microvascular and endoscopic techniques to the neurosurgery in Nigeria. Professor Neurobiology Research Lab Laboratory at the Department of Anatomy, University of Ibadan, where he has studied pediatric hydrocephalus using experimental models in rodents and more recently in pigs. His current interest in this area is in exploring how those cellular and molecular mechanisms in pediatric hydrocephalus can be pharmacologically modified to provide the basis for adjuvant therapy in this disorder. He has trained several MSc and six PhD students in anatomy and is currently supervising two PhD and two MD students. He has authored over 160 publications. He has served on the editorial board of neurosurgery, African Journal of Medicine, West African Journal of Medicine, Nigerian Journal of Surgery, and currently serves on the board of archives of neurosurgery in Africa, Journal of Clinical and Applied Neuroscience, and the Journal of the Nigerian Academy of Medicine. He was the Provost College of Medicine, University of Ibadan between 1998 and 2002. He was a pioneer head of the newly created Department of Neurological Surgery and the pioneer direct director of the Institute of Neurosciences, both of the College, University College Hospital Ibadan in 2006. He was a member of the board slash governing council of several institutions, including the University of Ibadan, University College Hospital, the National Hospital Abuja, the Nigerian Universities Commissions, and the West African College of Surgeon. He is a past president of the Anatomical Society of West Africa, the Nigerian Surgical Research Society, the Nigerian Society of Neurological Sciences, NSNS, and the Nigerian Academy of Neurological Surgeons, NANS. He's currently a trustee of both NSNS and NANS and an honorary president of the latter. Professor Shokumbi was elected fellow of the Nigerian Academy of Science in 2006, served as council member, academic secretary, academic secretary of the, for the biological section and treasurer of the academy. Is a founding fellow of Nigerian Academy of Medicine and serves on its governing council. He was an international advisor to the Macri University in Uganda during the transformation of his medical school to collegiate status in 2001 and was the advisor under the auspices of the WHO to the government of Zambia for the establishment of his second public medical school at the Copper Bell University in Ndola in 2010. Professor Shokumbi enjoys posh rackets in Scrabble and is an avid golfer. He's married to Guralla, his friend of 50 years, a professor of hematology, and they are blessed with children and grandchildren. Welcome with me, Professor Timitaya Shokumbi to this platform. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for this um, very generous introduction. I think the greatest distinction I can claim is being among so many young people this evening and also seeing the names of contemporaries and colleagues uh, on the list of uh, participants. Um, it's, it's really nice to listen to younger people who come in with new ideas, new thoughts, and new trajectories to discuss and I, I look forward to learning from everyone as we listen to the two young men who are going to be, younger people who are going to be doing this presentation this evening. Thank you very much, Kemi. I look forward to the event. Thank you, sir. Dr. Chike Okeke, are you ready now?
Dr. KK, kindly confirm if you're on this platform with us. Yes, yes, I'm I'm here, but I'm still not the host still is uh, I can't share my screen. Dr. KK, you are the host. And you don't have to be host to share a screen. Good afternoon. Good, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Prof. Good afternoon, my teachers. I don't know whether I can be heard and whether the network is. Can I start, please? Yes, please. You're doing good. We can see, we, we can both see and hear you. Oh, thank you very much. Good afternoon, Prof. Good afternoon, my teachers. Good afternoon, consultants, and my fellow residents, and every other person in this room. I'm Dr. Okeke Chike, a resident in Hello. Oh, this is for sure where you'll be presenting next. Okay, I'm Dr. Okeke Chike from Nandasku University Teaching Hospital, Newi. I'm a resident in neurosurgery. So today I'll be taking the, the topic, the raised intracranial pressure. I'll be taking it alongside another resident from the uh, University of Nigeria Teaching Hospital. And my topic is, um, I will be taking the physiology the pathology, the physiology, the pathophysiology, and the clinical presentation of raised intracranial pressure. So these are my outline. I don't know whether I can be heard very well. We are with you. Oh, okay. Thank you very much. So. So by way of introduction, the mechanism of raising intracranial pressure has been extensively been a study research that has been ongoing for the past 200 years. And the research is still ongoing, even presently as we, as we are discussing this topic to understand the mechanism of this pathology, that's the raising intracranial pressure, and of course, the comorbidities and mortalities that is associated with it. Raising intracranial pressure is the most significant factor that determines the. Excuse me. Sorry, I want to so that it will not be obstructing the slides. Thank you very much. So therefore, raising intracranial, um, intracranial pressure is the most significant factor that determines the outcome of morbidity and mortality risk in a patient with acute intracranial injuries. It's also the final common pathway for many of the intracranial pathologies and has a profound outcome on the final pathway of the intracranial injuries through pathologies. Therefore, optim optimal clinical assessment and management of these patients will require a detailed understanding of the normal physiology of intracranial pressure, then the pathophysiology and the means by which this 
raising intracranial pressure can occur and how to be, how it will be treated. Now, from the historical perspective, the importance of intracranial pressure was actually first recorded by Alexander Monroe. He's actually a Scottish surgeon and anatomist from Edinburgh with his students, George Kelly, during the 18th century in Edinburgh, Scotland. So they were the people that postulated this hypothesis we are talking about that is known as Monroe Kelly's uh, hypothesis. It actually stated that the intracranial compartment, hello, the, the intracranial compartment is a rigid encased structure that contains three unyielding, that contains intracranial structures, three unyielding intracranial structures, and that column of intracranial structures are constant at any given time. Hello. Then in 1891, Quinke published the first studies on the techniques of lumbar puncture and insisted that a glass pipette be affixed to the needle so that the CSF pressure could be measured. Then in 1903, Cushing described what we come to know as the Cushing trial. He also modified the model Kelly's principle, who did not really explain the whole physiology behind physiology and physio physiology behind intracranial pressure. I don't know if there is interference. I think it's not for my side. Dr. Tiki, I think you can mute the person. Is someone, it's an ascent that is um, very, so you can mute the person. You're the host. Okay, sir. Uh, well, I can't see the person for now. Let's continue, sir. I can't see the person. The name is right, right below yours. Ascend, A R S E N D. Okay, sorry. Uh. It's okay, I said, okay, I've seen. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Please, sorry for that delay. So, the So Cushing described what we know that what is we now use more today as modified Monroe Kelly's um, hypothesis. And in his own hypothesis, now he continued, he agreed with um, Monroe Kelly's principle that the intracranial comp compartment contains three intracranial structures that are. Um, that, that are constant. However, if there is an increase in volume in any one of these intracranial structures, then the other two structures, when I mean these three intracranial structures, I mean the brain, the cerebrospinal fluid, and the blood. So for a reason, if for any reason there is increase in volume of one of these three, then there will be a compensatory decrease in one or the other remaining two in order to maintain normal intracranial pressure. He also, he also stated that um, we should also understand that this concept applies to older children and adults. However, in the younger children, that in the younger children that the sutural, open sutural line and front tunnels also give room for more compliance to accommodate more volume, hence not necessarily giving raising intracranial pressure early. So before we go into the physiology, let us briefly talk, look at the relevant anatomy to understand this uh, rigid encasement. So as you can see here, this is the, the skull, which is the rigid compartment that contains these uh, three structures, of course. So of, of more important is the 
front tunnels and of course the sutural lines as you can see. So this is anterior and posterior front tunnel and of course the mastoid front tunnel and the, um, the sphenoidal front tunnel. These are all the openings, hiatus that can give a modification to allow for extra volume, extra volume in a, if there is need for extra volume, if there are, for any reason there is increase in volume in one of all these three structures. However, when there is fusion of all those things, that is when we now start having the problem that, uh, that we are going to, fat pathophysiology that we're going to discuss um, further down the line. So now when we go to the relevant physiology, as we said before, that the brain is confined by the rigid container, that's the skull and it's incompressible, incompre incompressible structure. And mm -hmm. the main content of, the three contents of this rigid container, rigid encasements are the brain parenchyma, which contains the majority of the intracranial um, compartments, occupying about one, as the volume is about 1,300 1, to 1,400 mils and the comprises of 80% of intracranial compartments. Then the other structures are the blood and the cerebrospinal fluid, CSF, which made up about 10% each. That's between 100 to 150 mils each of intracranial compartments. So this is the diagram explaining what I just said now. As you can see, this is the brain matter that uh, comprises most of the intracranial compartments. Of course, this is the blood and the CSF. As you can see, it's the one that has the more volume. So when we continue, so like we said before, these three tissues, exact pressure in the intracranial compartments where they are accommodated. And we all know that pressure is, pressure is defined weight over the surface area. That's the effect of the weight or force per surface area. So if it is the weight over surface area, it now entails that the, these three incompressible structures, that is the blood, the, blood, the brain and the CSF, they are, they are what the, the, the weight over the surface area in the intracranial compartment is what, we know, what is known as the intracranial pressure, ICP. And the pressure of the three of them is that within the intracranial pressure in a normal adult is around 10 millimeter of mercury or even less. In pediatrics, the value can be much lower. So these are the different ranges for different intracranial pressure. Like I said before, adult is between 10 to 15. In children, younger children between three to seven and term in fact is 1.5 to six. Even in neonates and preterm baby is much, much uh, lower. So the most important role in the circulatory system, apart from the transportation of blood to all parts of the body is to maintain the normal optimal cerebral perfusion pressure. Now this cerebral perfusion pressure is actually the pressure that is required to supply oxygen and nutrients to the brain for optimal function of the brain and is therefore determined by the cerebral blood flow. For the brain to, for it, for, for the brain to have the optimal function, the cerebral perfusion pressure must be great up to 50 millimeter of mercury and more. Normal range is between 50 to 150 for it to have a normal optimal um, brain function. Where it is below that, um, this regulation will set in. So below this value, the brain goes into suboptimal function and impair auto regulation. Now, when we talk about this auto regulation, what do we mean? We mean that auto regulation is inherent ability of the blood to maintain a fairly steady cerebral blood flow. That's why wide variation in systemic blood pressure in order to ensure adequate and steady cerebral perfusion pressure, and also to maintain the viability of the brain for optimal neurological function. Now, this cerebral perfusion pressure, like I said before, is usually maintained between 50 to 150. 
for normal um, brain function. And beyond this range, like we said, auto regulation is lost. And cerebral blood fluid now becomes largely dependent on pressure. And eventually, this may cause uh, brain barrier damage. Then when we want to determine the blood flow, from what we know, we know that flow, normal flow in physics is pressure over resistance. So if flow is pressure over resistance, then it entails that cerebral blood flow is equal to cerebral perfusion pressure over cerebral vascular resistance. That is the formula for cerebral blood flow. This cerebral blood flow is the blood volume that flows through a unit of a unit mass of the brain tissue per unit time. It's usually expressed in unit of male per 100 gram, per 100 gram of tissue per minute. The normal cerebral blood flow in adult is between 50 to 100 mils per 100 gram of brain tissue per minute. Most of the um, cerebral, most of the higher quantity of this flow is um, the brain, gray matter require more. It takes about 80 mils per 100 gram of brain tissue per minute. Whereas the white matter is between 45 mils to 100 gram, gram tissue per minute. Now, if the white matter, oh, you yeah, are talking of regional cerebral blood flow. No, he said 14 mil. Hello. Hello. Hey. Sorry, can I be heard? Yes, yes, you are heard. Oh, okay. Sorry. 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 Thank you. So when the cerebral blood flow is below. Hello? It seems like I'm not. Can I be heard? <laughs> yeah, how people? We can hear you. Please go ahead. Oh, OK. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. OK. So when the cerebral blood flow is below 50, like around 20 mils per 100 gram per minute, um, ischemic changes sets in. Below 10 mils per 100 gram per minute, of course, causes permanent uh, neurology. Factors that regulate cerebral blood flow under physiology condition are the cerebral perfusion pressure that we just um, discussed about, partial pressure of oxygen and CO2. Then mathematically, cerebral perfusion pressure is mean arterial pressure minus intracranial pressure. So for us to get the mean arterial pressure is usually um, calculated as diastolic, summation of diastolic blood pressure plus one third pulse pressure or two third of diastolic blood pressure plus one third uh, systolic uh, blood pressure. So now having discussed about this uh, physiology, we'll go into the pathophysiology. So the mechanism of phrase intracranial pressure are best understood by considering the normal physiology of the pressure within the intracranial cavity. The intracranial pressure is directly related to the volume of the intracranial content within the skull. Any increase in the volume content, intracranial volume, will, alternate, will also have effect in rising intracranial pressure. However, we should also know that initially, when a small increase in volume of intracranial content will cause no rise in intracranial pressure. This is because this small amount, because there is a small is potential space, subarachnoid space, which is distensible, where a small amount of CSF can move out into the subarachnoid places and uh, create more space for this uh, increased volume. Okay, to allow for increased uh, volume of, to allow this extra volume that entered. However, this could be relatively a close encasement, 
a volume, there are a volume we reach where this compensatory mechanism cannot hold on again. And it will now cause exponential rise in intracranial pressure with further increase in volume. Therefore, various mathematical models have been described to define this volume pressure relationship. One of them is a compliance, and the other one is a last time. Now, in compliance, this is a measure of the sensibility of the intracranial um, space. It is defined as a change in volume per unit change in pressure. Therefore, if, there, if, the, um, if an intracranial compartment has a higher compliance, then the larger is, is the extra volume that it can contain within the cranium without necessarily causing a raise in tracranial pressure. This is applicable to much younger children and infants and the uh, neonates. Whereas in elastance, that's the, the P over the V, is actually inversely related to the compliance. And in this case, it measures the it measures the resistance offered by the expanding intracranial mass, the resistance of the encasement to the expanding intracranial lesion. Now, the calculated pro, um, pressure volume index that is needed to cause a raise in intracranial pressure by a factor of 10 is like about 25 to 30 mils. So this is what I'm trying to explain when I said what I said. This is a the rigid compartment, like we said, containing the brain, of course, the blood and the CSF. So now, if there is a space occupying lesion, causing a, an increase in volume for all those, there will be a compensatory mechanism by either the CSF or the flow, as you can see here. Now, as it gets to increase more, you can notice that the volume of the container here fills up. So this is a kind of a compensatory mechanism for this. You now imagine where the volume, intracranial volume is larger than what is um, going out. Intracranial pressure will now um, set in. So in terms of pathophysiology now, like we said before, cerebral perfusion pressure is actually mean arterial pressure minus intracranial pressure. So what it means is that um, intracranial pressure is mean arterial pressure minus cerebral perfusion pressure. So for a rise in intracranial pressure, it will lead to a decrease in cerebral perfusion pressure to maintain the brain auto-regulation. And for optimal auto-regulation of the brain to continue, there will be a commensurate rise of mean arterial pressure to counter the effect of the raise intracranial pressure and therefore maintaining the normal um, brain perfusion from the cerebral perfusion pressure. Now, this concurrent rise of mean arterial pressure as a result of rise in intracranial pressure is what is known as a Cushing reflex. Then, if this reflex is sustained over a period of time, the intracranial pressure will continue to rise. And once it continues to rise, the mean arterial pressure will continue to rise also to counter the effect of this. Uh, raising tracranial pressure. And at a point, it gets to a dangerous level that it can trigger um, cardiovascular accident. So physiologically, therefore, when cushion reflex is sustained towards a dangerous level, the brain, the brain will trigger a negative feedback mechanism. That's a protective response in order to reduce this persistent stimulation that is perceived by the vasomotor center. This protective vagal response will lead to reduction in heart rate, that's bradycardia. And consequently, abnormal respiratory rate and pattern may supervene due to non-specific responses from the cardio respiratory center. Under this condition, the resultant clinical features that are dictated, that is um, raising tracranial pressure with concomitant uh, mean arterial pressure, bradycardia and irregular um, irregular respiratory pattern is what is known as Cushing triad. It should be noted that this, um, we should know that this Cushing triad is only seen in 33% of the normal 
increase intracranial, that's intracranial hypertension patients. So only 33% of them will manifest with this uh, classical Cushing triad. So when we go to the grading of the raised intracranial pressure, a raised intracranial pressure is one that, like we said before, is uh, above 10 millimeter of mercury. Some people may say up to 14 to 15. Now it's divided into mild, moderate, and uh, severe. For mild intracranial, um, for mild raised intracranial pressure, that mild uh, intracranial hypertension, the value is greater than 10 to 20. Moderate is between 21 to 40. And of course, severe is more than 40 millimeter of mercury. This grade should be viewed as a mere pointer to various degree which the ICP can rise. Then some, some, there, are so, so many, there are so many controversies as to when one should initiate treatment. Some people can even start as soon as the raising tracheal pressure is up to 15 millimeter of mercury, some 20 and some even 25, especially in a patient with a head injury. Now for this uh, raising tracheal um, pressure, intracranial hypertension, it is broadly classified into two main types. We have the acute, and of course we have the subacute um, or chronic uh, and chronic type. So the features that the acute people will present with, most of them will come with a, it will come with sudden onset in emergency presentation and uh, with um, sudden decreasing alter sensorium and loss of consciousness. And this is usually seen in patients with severe traumatic brain injury and the uh, acute uh, space occupying lesion um, secondary to trauma like uh, acute epidural hematoma uh, um, and the uh, subdural hematoma. And even um, in some cases like cerebrovascular accident, that's hemorrhagic cerebrovascular accident like subarachnoid hemorrhage. So all these ones can come in can present with acute features. Then for the subacute or chronic, it comes over a period of time. And these normal classical symptoms and classical features of raising intracranial pressure is noticed more in this area. And all this compensatory mechanism is usually seen in the chronic or subacute um, intracranial hypertension. Typical example is that it's seen in the hydrocephalus uh, patients. So when we talk about the etiology, these are the different etiological factors that have been implicated. Of course, said injury, which is one of the, com um, the most common uh, etiological factor, especially in this our developing country. Intracranial hemorrhages, they are all- We have one more minister, Dr. Chiki. Hello? Yes, we have one more minister. Okay, I did not. Yeah, yeah. So these are the risk factors as can be that has been implicated: head injury, cerebrovascular um, accident like subarachnoid hemorrhage, the hydrocephalus that will manifest as uh, most times um, chronic type, the brain tumors, degenerative diseases, and others like uh, foreign cephalysis, leptomeningeal cyst. All those ones have been implicated to cause. Uh, um, intracranial hypertension. Then when we go to the stages, we're using the um, coca stages for cerebral com compression as was defined by Langfield et al. Is broadly divided into four stages, stage one to four. Stage one is a spatial compensation. Here, the compensatory mechanism is still working. So the patient will not manifest with the uh, um, symptoms of uh, intracranial hypertension. However, in stage two, the compensatory mechanism has been exhausted and patient will begin to manifest with signs and symptoms of, early signs and symptoms of uh, raising intracranial pressure like headache, drowsiness, and gradual alter the sensorium. In stage three, it's actually now severe, but reversible. Here, the patient will 
um, have a deterioration in conscious level, or like it's the issue that patient may be drowsy and be complaining about headache, then um, elevated the uh, blood pressure, bradycardia. Then in grade four, which is the final stage, it's usually irreversible. Most times the patient will come with a bilateral dilated uh, pupil. The BP is now going down. Most of them may not be able to make it if urgent intervention is not done. So these are the different herniation syndromes that we can see from um, caused by raising tracheal pressure. If you look at this diagram, let's assume that this is the um, extra volume that is trying to find the space within these rigid encasements. So these are all the places that it can cause the pressure. Of course, you can see the onchal herniation moving into the um, posterior fossa. You can see the um, cingulate uh, herniation. Of course, this one here is a trans, um, transcarvaria um, herniation. So for the singular tenation, uh, they do not have a classical symptom. It's a supratentorial mass lesion that may display the singular gyrus, which is very, which is very close to the four cerebra, and eventually causing the herniation of the um, of the gyrus beneath the um, the four cerebra, and with it with associated ventricular displacement of the ventricular system. The anterior cerebral artery may also be compromised by the tight, the tight sharp edges of this uh, false uh, cerebra. Like I said before, there are no classical clinical signs and symptoms. And they may also present, present with the anterior stroke, which uh, will come with a focal control, lateral lower extremity hemiplegia. Then let's go to the onchal herniation, which is one of the most common one you see with patient with a raising tracrania. Um, pressure, when the expansive mass in the middle fossa causes the uncles to herniate between the rostra, um, between the proximal part of the brainstem and the tentorial edge into the posterior fossa. In some instances, this displacement of the brainstem by the uncles may cause compression of the contralateral cerebral pedenco against the opposite uh, tentorial edges, producing the paradisical identification that we call the Conahan's uh, nosh. The clinical symptom consists of the following triad, progressive impaired consciousness, dilated ipsilateral pupil, and of course, contralateral hemiplegia. Now the impaired consciousness can result from compression of the reticular activating system in the um, proximal part of the brainstem why the dilated pupil um, result from the compression of the ipsilateral third ventricle. Uh, when can enhance uh, notch phenomenon? When can enhance notch phenomenon is present, this hemiplegia will now be, instead of being on the contralateral side, will now be on the ipsilateral side. Now, other herniations that we can talk about are the central transtentorial herniation, which Typical example you can see is when there is a bilateral mass lesion, such as a subdural hematoma, causing a mass herniation bulging down of the uh, midbrain structures and the diacephalon through the um, tentoria incisura. Then let's talk about the tonsillar herniation, which is also very dangerous. This one results from acute expansion of the posterior fossa lesions. It actually occurs in the posterior fossa. Um, typical example where it can be found is a patient that um, undergoes a lumbar puncture with a raising tracheal pressure. This can lead to the tonsils of the cerebellum penetrating through the foramen magnum into the spinal canal and compressing the medulla. The manifestation of acute medullary um, compression are the cardiorespiratory impairment, um, chestoke respiration, hypertension, and the high post uh, pressure. Okay, let's move over to the clinical um, presentation. Okay, we'll still have other ones like uh, upward herniations. Let's move on to the clinical presentation. So, some of the um, 
the clinical presentations that the patients can manifest with, they are broadly and classified as either early clinical um, signs and symptoms or late. For early presentation, most of the patient will come with a history of headache, projectile vomiting, which is not induced by, which is not associated with nausea. Then drowsiness, alter level of consciousness, irritability, sun setting eye appearance, and the cranial nerve palsy. Hello. Go For on, the late please. presentation, they will present with further deterioration, bulging fontanel, um, papilo edema, dilated numb reactive pupil, elevated BP, the classical cushion prior and the bradycardia. Hello. Okay. Uh, I think this is where I will stop. Thank you very much, Dr. Chiki. So now we'll invite the second presenter to kindly upload his um, slides. Dr. Bright, Dr. Bright Mulikela, please. Welcome on board. Good evening, professors, consultants, senior colleagues and colleagues. Um, Dr. Bright Uchimwekala from University of Nigeria Teaching Hospital, Neurosurgery yeah. Unit. Please, can I be granted the permission to share my slides? Go ahead, please. We would appreciate if you can keep this within 20 minutes, please. Okay. Huh? I'm seeing who's disabled participant sharing. That it was, you try again. Bright, Michael, yeah. Uh, I think use the, my, yeah, PC. I want to use my uh, temporary. Do you raise your hand on it, please, so we can identify it? Thank you. We can see your slide. Please put it in slideshow mode. Okay. Thank you. I'll be continuing the presentation, starting on existing protocol already established by my colleague, Dr. Chi Dukeke, uh, with the intracranial pressure monitoring and management. I will be using the outline, case summary, introduction. Um, some of the ones you just talked about, I won't go through them again. A 
In our year old meal, referred to our neurosurgery clinic, a history of loss of vision in the left eye of five years duration, which was observed when mother noted preference of the child reading with the right eye. There was no history of trauma, previous cranial autonomic surgery. Delivery was at 26 weeks gestation with outcome of a pretend lubed with, who was managed in special care unit for three months. He achieved neurological milestones at appropriate times with normal cognitive ability. He was followed up. His academic performance has been average and he was initially referred to the ophthalmologist at the onset of visual loss. Then following review of neuroimaging, he was thereafter referred to the neurosurgeons. Patient was evaluated of time evaluation done confirmed loss of vision in the left eye from confrontational assessment and uh, central visual field assessment. On this copy noted properly, Tima in that uh, was worse in the left eye. And uh, counseling was done for need for invasive intracranial pressure monitoring and to further buttress the need for possible surgical intervention. Examination finding was a young boy with obvious cafocephaly. The glycoma mass scale was 15. Minimental state uh, was intact. Pupils were four millimeter, briskly reactive to light. Visual acuity was, uh, it was noted to be able to read prints with the right eye, but no light perception, the left eye. Then tone. Uh, was normal in all limbs. Then the medical research cancer power assessment of both upper and lower limbs found a grade five in all myodons. Sensation was preserved. Deep tendon reflexes were normal bilaterally. He was a diagnosis of a cranial synostosis with a neurological sequel of left visual loss was made. The The CT scan, the cranial uh, computer tomography scan done showed uh, a copper beating appearance of the inner table of the uh, of the bone, then the effacement of the sulci and gyra, then the ventricles were actually uneffaced and there were no uh, um, and these um, systems were also noted to be unifaced. So the knowledge of intracranial pressure is the basis of appropriate neuro neurosurgical treatment and monitoring the in the surveillance of patients with acute brain injury or disease and of individuals with chronic neurological problems. Clinical fundoscopic and radiological data cannot be underestimated. However, there are non-invasive means of monitoring, but they are not as reliable as the invasive means of monitoring. Oh. The measurement of the intracranial pressure is useful to prevent consequences, which may be shortened by brain herniation or uh, long term, like in this child who had visual problems, loss of vision on the left eye. And intra elevated intracranial pressure with dilatation of the ventricles is a common finding in patients with hydrocephalus. But with elevation of intracranial pressure with normal ventricles, it's a common finding. I see, I see. I see. I see. Sorry, please. Hi, everyone. Can we all mute uh, our devices so we can hear the presenter very well? Okay. 
the historical perspective, my colleague has mentioned about the Monroe Kelly doctrine by Alan Moore. Then Quinke, Henry Quinke in 1891 was the uh, first to go about assessing uh, lumbar uh, cerebrospinal fluid pressure via lumbar uh, puncture. And thereafter, uh, thesis on intracranial pressure monitoring by Perry Jani in 1950 in Japan uh, came up. Then Niels Lundberg in the 1960s was actually the advent of the era of modern intracranial pressure monitoring, where intracranial pressure uh, was being monitored using a ventricular catheter connected to an external um, stream gauge pressure transducer and uh, in writing potentiometer recorder was recording uh, the, the findings and it came up with a, it was actually the era from which modern intracranial pressure okay, and I'll tell you what to the and uh, in the yes. 1980s, yeah, there was an introduction of you. dedicated yes. intracranial pressure transducers, which has Not actually uh, revolutionized the use of intracranial pressure monitoring in management of patients. He has talked about the clinical presentations. I won't go through them. Uh, these are some radiologic uh, uh, sections of uh, some patients with certain pathologies. The first has an extradural hematoma, which is seen uh, at this point in the um, right frontal region. The second has a intracerebral abscesses. The third has an arachnoid cyst. And the fourth is actually a, a a section, one of the pictures, uh, clinical photo uh, sections taken from the patient that I presented, that there yeah, was a copper beating appearance of the inner table of the uh, skull, then the placement of the ventricles. So in all these, the soccer and gyra were effaced. In the first with the stradural hematoma, there is a midline sheet. There is a placement of the ventricle, which shows that there, uh, with, with this um, collection of blood, this hematoma, there is pressure within the brain. So raising intracranial pressure is imminent in this patient and monitoring is important. And for this patient needs urgent intervention for which evacuation of the surgery hematoma was done. Then for the patient with abscesses, uh, measures to drain the abscesses we are done. Then for the patient with the arachnoid cyst, the management was instituted. So for the intracranial pressure monitoring, they are divided into three categories. The individuals with traumatic brain injury are under category A. And much of the studies that have been done in intracranial pressure monitoring are based on traumatic brain injury. The second category are uh, non-traumatic brain injured patients who need neurointensive surveillance. And the third category uh, for patients where diagnosis of subacute or chronic health conditions are being made. So, uh, instances for the category A patient with a, a epidural hematoma, extradural hematoma, just as in one of the uh, sections of the CT that was displayed earlier in the radiologic assessment, then subdural hematoma, then in foreign body uh, in the uh, brain, then depressed core fracture, then patients with um, mass scale of eight or less, then patients with high risk of progression of the structural injury they have, such as patients with large contusions or uh, coagulopathy. Then for the category B, patients with subarachnoid hemorrhage, patients with spontaneous intracerebral bleeds with mass effect, then central nervous system infections from meningitis, cerebral abscess, acute liver failure, in-stage kidney failure, hypertensive encephalopathy. Then the third category, that's for diagnosis of some chronic uh, 
subacute or chronic diseases like hydrocephalus, which may be communicating uh, hydrocephalus, not communicating normal pressure hydrocephalus, then idiopathic intracranial pressure, which is a condition characterized by raised intracranial pressure without the evidence. Then intracranial tumors. Uh, the modalities of monitoring of patients may be non-invasive or invasive. The, invasive, the non-invasive method uh, include, among others, optic nerve sheet diameter, transcranial Doppler, ultrasonography, ophthalmodynamometry, uh, cochlear fluid pressure. For the trans, for the optic nerve sheet diameter, what uh, happens here is that the is a high frequency probe that is used because the optic nerve is a superficial structure. So the eyes is closed and uh, a transparent uh, material can be used to cover the eyes. Then gel is, is used. So then is used over the uh, eyes. Then the uh, probe, the high frequency probe is applied in axial uh, view to look at the uh, optic nerve sheet. What happens is that posterior to the retina, the normal is at three millimeters posterior to the retina. The optic nerve sheet diameter is taken, and the normal should be four millimeter or less. Uh, some say it should be less than five millimeter. However, when it is more than five millimeter, it is sensitive uh, to raise intracranial pressure, and it's been found that. This value plateaus at uh, 7.5 millimeters. That means at 7.5 millimeters, may not be having increasing values uh, of the optic nerve sheet diameter. However, the intracranial pressure may be markedly elevated. The transcranial Doppler ultrasonography is another, which assesses the cerebrovascular dynamics through the cerebral blood flow velocity. So the flow velocity is uh, of the uh, cerebral vessel is used in this and detection of uh, intracranial pressures greater than or equal to 20 millimeters of mercury. They have, the findings are between 0 0.62 to 0 0.92 on the measurement with the intracranial uh, um, uh, waveforms that are noted. Then the ophthalmodynamometry is another. The um, central retinal vein is found within the optic uh, nerve sheets and is being found that when there is no raised, when the pressure is not raised, the pulsation of the, there is venous pulsation noted and papil edema is not overt. However, with raised intracranial pressure, the, uh, op, the venous pulsation is reduced uh, or absent. Papil edema may be noted and uh, the ophthalmodynamometry actually measures the pressure within the retinal vein. And it's been found that there is a correlation between the central retinal vein pressure with the intracranial pressure, so that it increases. Another is uh, the cochlear pressure, which is a non-invasive method of assessing the intracranial pressure. What happens is that there is a transmission of the intracranial pressure to the perilymph in the cochlea. And it's been observed that there is a displacement of the tympanic membrane during stapedia reflex. And um, these pressure changes reflects raised intracranial pressure. However, it's been found that this is not specific for intracranial pressure monitoring. And these non-invasive methods uh, cannot be used for long-term monitoring. They are not specific, they are, uh, they are values, they don't give specific values for the extent of the intracranial pressure. Then with the development of the invasive methods of monitoring, the external ventricular drainage system or the, ventric or the ventriculostomy drain uh, was the first and, new, and said to be the gold standard. However, the intraparenchymal uh, catheters or boots has also come to be to receive wide acceptance. There are some less accurate 
methods of monitoring, which include the subarachnoid boards, the subdural monitor, the epidural monitor, and the fontanometry. Then about the external ventricular drain for the invasive monitoring. Okay, this is a pictorial, uh, a clinical photograph of the different modes of monitoring, both invasive and non-invasive. The optic nerve sheets, diameter measurement with the ultrasound scan, then the transcranial uh, pressure monitoring, then the interparenchymal uh, monitor with the catheter, the external ventricular drainage, then the combination of ventricular catheter and multimodality probe. So going to the, um, he has mentioned about, my colleague has talked about the normal values of intracranial pressure. Then going to the uh, ventriculostomy drain, it requires a borehole with introduction of a catheter through the brain parenchyma into the lateral ventricle. Then the external uh, pressure, uh, a transducer is connected to this uh, catheter. And it's important to zero the uh, ICP value so that accurate measurement can be gotten. The ventriculosomy drain has an advantage of be of uh, being able to be used to drain the CSF, CSF spinal fluid when the intracranial pressure is markedly high. So it offers therapeutic advantage compared to uh, other modes of invasive intracranial pressure monitoring. Then it has some uh, associated complications which may range from uh, um, intracranial um, hemorrhage because it has to do with a surgical procedure where the catheter is passed into the ventricle. The risk of infection is also high and the patient must, uh, the, the external drain must be at a particular level. The transducer must be at the level of the external obstetric and the, um, the zero it must always be done to have an to have valid uh, intracranial pressure uh, measurements. Then the, okay, this is a, a clinical uh, photograph, a clinical uh, picture of a patient with external ventricular uh, drainage system. And it's always, the transducer is put at the level of the external auditory meatus. And yes. the drain is hung on a, a stand and the intraventricular catheter is connected to the bag. So pressure changes are noted uh, in these patients and the transducer is connected to a monitor so that the values can be uh, seen on the monitor and the waveforms can also be seen. The other is intraparenchymal drain placement. Both the intraventricular uh, drainage system and intraparenchymal drain system requires admission into the intensive care unit. And uh, there are surgical procedures that request you know, surgical uh, intervention so that a ball is done. It can be at the Cooper's point or the King's point in a standard fashion. Then uh, for the intraparenchymal drain placement, the precision catheter is turned through a different stab incision where a, 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 a P-level catheter or a splicable tunnel is Then the, the accessory cable is connected to the zero point simulator, which is the NPS2 and uh, yeah. connected to the monitor via the yeah, invasive blood pressure monitoring nice, port. Uh, in the nine, ICP dialog box. Please, I'm particularly using connecting this across. 
Professor Jimo to kindly mute his mic. Mute, brother. Dr. Bright, you seem muted. We can't hear you. Could you unmute, please, Dr. Bright? Oh, sorry about that. So the um, interparenchymal catheter is connected to the accessory uh, catheter, which is connected to the zero uh, simulator, which is the NPS2. And the NPS2 is connected to the monitor via the invasive blood pressure port. And at the uh, the dialog box for the for the intracranial pressure is um, clicked. That's at this point, ICP dialog box. Then this comes up. When this comes up, the ICP is clicked. And when it is clicked, the MPS2 has a button where the zero in is done. So while the thumb is placed at the button on the MPS2 to, to zero, the point on this dialog box where zero in is, is clicked and it's naturally zeros. Thereafter, the uh, dialog box that displays is closed. Then at this point here, we have the three dots, the intracranial pressure value comes up. So um, that's using the patient monitor. However, there are some uh, modifiable, uh, there are modified forms so that the patient can be, can have this monitoring done even outside the intensive care unit. We have this uh, data logger has been developed. This data logger records the ICP and also stores the value so that at any time it can be recorded and the values uh, can be assessed. So this is the um, value. This is what happens after the zeroing is done. The waveform is noted and the value of the intracranial pressure is noted. And is the normal intracranial pressure waveform has three peaks. That's the three piece. The first one is the percussion wave, where the percussion wave correlates with the arterial uh, pulsation, which is transmitted to the choroid plexus. Then the second is the, the second waveform, which is the P2, is described as the tidal wave, which represents the uh, cerebral compliance. That's the balance between the pressure and volume in the intracranial, in the uh, brain. Then the third waveform, which is the P3, is the dichrotic waveform, which correlates with the closure of the aortic valve. So this is the normal intracranial uh, pressure waveform. So, uh, when there is anomaly in this, the values will also be shown. So for this patient, the index patient that was pre presented as a case, uh, the case summary was done. The immediately after the uh, the zeroing was done, the value came up to be 17 millimeters of mercury, and this is a nine-year-old child. So this is high for his age. So limitations of uh, this includes intensive care unit admission. There's limited mobility because the patient is uh, always connected to the uh, monitor, the monitor in the intensive care units. And there's a risk of dislodgement during patient care, maybe in transport of this patient, or if the patient is uncooperative. And 
sometimes the patient cannot be there for a long time. Hence, it's only for a short-term monitoring. And there are some findings that have been noted with uh, investing in intracranial pressure uh, monitoring. They include uh, the fact that the duration of monitoring has to be when until the intracranial pressure is normal within 48 to 72 hours. That's when this uh, monitoring can stop, especially in traumatic cases. Then care is also taken because it may seem normal in the first uh, two days of admission when the patient may have some conditions that may have a second peak at about the 9 to 11 days, such as in pediatric patients, patients with large uh, conditions. So it's important to watch out for delayed deterioration. This is actually uh, from studies uh, based on traumatic brain injury. Then there was a, a a publication of the best trip, which is a benchmark evidence from South American trials, treatment of intracranial pressure. It was a multi-center randomized trial that was done in Bolivia and Ecuador, and it compared intracranial pressure uh, directed management and a computer tomography imaging and clinical examination guided management protocol. It found that there was no difference in morbidity or mortality measured at six months after the injury. And the study was to compare different, two different management strategies for severe traumatic pain. However, the highlight is that there was a need for deeper understanding of the pathophysiology of traumatic brain injury and the interpretation of intracranial pressure in context of clinical radiographic monitoring uh, information to individualize, individualize care. And it's also been noted that intracranial pressure in trauma is very important within the first 48 hours because it gives an idea of the morbidity, mortality, and functional recovery within the first six months post injury. So the basic requirements for this invasive intracranial pressure monitoring includes minimal trauma during the placement, negligible risk of of infection, that's why it's prepared in the intensive care unit. And there should be no CSF leakage in course of this procedure. And it is easy to handle, reliable, and able to continue function during various diagnostic and therapeutic procedures, especially for the intraventricular uh, catheter ICP monitoring. Then following the limitations of this bedside intracranial pressure monitoring. The telemetric intracranial pressure monitoring has been developed, where it offers a possibility of long-term intracranial pressure monitoring, especially during everyday conditions outside the hospital. It involves a, an implant, implantable probe, antenna, portable recording, and it's, it's measured using an external reader or an antenna. So this is a is the implantable uh, uh, transducer with a chip within this, and it's usually put subgalial while the uh, transducer is placed in the intraparenchyma region. And this is the reader or the antenna, um, which is usually placed over this uh, site where the implantable P cell unit is placed. Then the, the data logger developed by Rumedic is connected to this antenna and the pressure can be monitored and it records auto, uh, automatic, uh, automatically into the data logger. This is an elderly man who is on intraparenchymal monitoring using the telemetric invasive intracranial pressure monitoring. Some publications has been, have been done about this. The first was about the uh, 10 persons that this telemetric intracranial pressure monitoring was done. It's found that out of the 10 persons, the risk of surgery was uh, reduced, especially for 
the category C of the patients, those with hydrocephalus and idiopathic hypertension. Then the second publication was on long-term telemetric intracranial pressure monitoring for patients with idiopathic intracranial hypertension. It was found that idiopathic, uh, idiopathic intracranial hypertension is commoner in obese women of childbearing age. And of the 78 persons that had features of intracranial, idiopathic intracranial hypertension, 20 opted in for the study. And of the 20, 16, we are females and uh, six, we are males. And they were divided into two groups, those who consented to home telemonitoring and those who consented to home monitoring. For those who had home telemonitoring, what was done was uh, calls we are made for an average of six to 13 minutes to assess the monitoring. They place the external, the antenna over the site where the uh, subgalial um, chip was placed and they monitor on the data logger, the values, what it was, and they communicate with the uh, doctor on the other side. So it was found that those who had home telemonitoring had a reduced hospital stay. None was associated with complication of infection, hemorrhage, uh, uh, worsening of condition. And those who uh, had home monitoring also didn't have any complication associated with them. However, it was found that of these 20, about three of them had issues with their data logger for which it was replaced and the handling was easy. Hence, the long-term monitoring of intracranial pressure by the telemetric method is now in practice. And these patients we are monitored for over three to six months. Majority of them were in three months. Those who consented to extended monitoring were monitored over six months. Then complications of invasive intracranial uh, monitoring range from intraventricular, uh, from bacterial colonization, hemorrhage, malfunction, malposition. Intraventricular catheter or intraventricular drain uh, has the highest bacterial colonization of 10 to 17 percent, whereas the subarachnoid group has 15 percent, and parenchymal, intraparenchymal monitoring had 14 percent. So intraventricular highest followed by intraparenchymal, then subarachnoid and subdural were lower. Then hemorrhage was found to be common in parenchymal, intraparenchymal monitoring compared to intraventricular. Malfunction for the intraparenchymal which was between 9 to 40, whereas intraventricular 6 to 3 percent. Malposition was common with intraventricular catheter whereas others wasn't noted to have uh, malposition. Then the identifiable risk for factors for infection in patients with invasive intracranial monitoring. A prospective study that was done in 1984 found increased risk with monitor duration lasting more than five days. And the risk increased over 42% by day 11. Then, um, there was no correlation with monitoring duration. However, a retrospective analysis found that there was no linear increase of risk during the first 10 to 12 days, after which the rate of infection diminished. Then other risk factors for infection are patients who had neurosurgical operation, not just for the in, uh, invasive intracranial pressure monitoring. If the irrigation system is in place, if there is a leakage of CSF, around the intraventricular catheter. If patient had open skull fracture, if patient had other infections, which may include septicemia or pneumonia. Then the factors are not associated with increased incidence of infection, including insertion of intraventricular catheter, previous intraventricular catheter, drainage of cerebrospinal fluid, use of steroids. And treatment option is removal of device, if at all needed, that's if the there is continue, if there is need for continued intracranial pressure monitoring, a consideration may be given to inserting uh, at another site for these patients. Then appropriate antibodies can be given. Intracranial pressure 
uh, elevation is one of the arms in the pathologies, yeah. in the pathophysiology of yeah, uh, problems with uh, brain injury or problems with in the brain, such that the intracranial pressure monitoring only yeah. is deficient in monitoring other parameters in this patient, which includes brain tissue oxygenation, temperature, cerebral blood flow, yeah, velocity, cerebral no, metabolism, cortical activity. Hence, the multi-modality approach has been developed to help in uh, better assessment of patients. Then, the management of patients with raised intracranial pressure it depends on the pathology. For every patient that presents in trauma, it's important to elevate the head of the bed to about 30 degrees. And yes. it's been found that for patients who have this, like the index case presentation that was done, when the intraparenchymal catheter was uh, connected to the uh, monitor, patient was supine when the, uh, the procedure was done. Immediately, the bed was elevated to 30 degrees. The intracranial pressure dropped from 25 millimeters of mercury to 17, which highlights the importance of head elevation of the head of the bed in intracranial pressure monitoring in, the, in patients with head injury. Placing them on cervical collar, which beyond uh, putting the neck in a neutral position and preventing further injuries if they are is a cervical spine injury, it helps to increase venous return, preventing kinking of the uh, veins, hence uh, reducing the risk of raising intracranial pressure. There are pharmacological therapies such as a 20% mannitol, 3% uh, saline infusion. Astazilamide has been found to be used, especially in patients with intracranial, idiopathic intracranial hypertension. And uh, it was found to be useful in their management when they were within the limits that require surgical uh, intervention. Surgical uh, procedures that can be done for patients with raised intracranial pressure. For patients with intraventricular uh, intracranial pressure monitoring, with the EVD in situ, with elevation of intracranial pressure, uh, cerebrospinal fluid can be drained via the, uh, via the EVD. Hence, there is a form of decompression that uh, goes on with that. So a therapeutic intervention is also part of it. Then for those with hydrocephalus, uh, ventricular peritoneal shunts can be done. Like for the patients that had telemetric monitoring, some of them had hydrocephalus and they were equivocal about whether to put a shunt or not. Uh, after the telemetric, the period of monitoring for three months, the values found to be consistently high among some patients was an indication for a ventricular peritoneal shunt. Ventricular arterial shunts can be done. Lumbar puncture, lumbar peritoneal shunt can also be done for these patients. Then um, endoscopic thought ventriculostomy with or without choroid plexuscoagulation can also be done for these patients who have uh, abnormalities with CSF. Uh, here. Then for patients with uh, trauma who may have a uh, Epidural hematoma, subdural hematoma, intraparenchymal uh, hemorrhage, or maybe large conditions that the intracranial pressure may be on the increase. So, craniotomy can be done. Um, craniectomy can be done. Then, for patients with uh, craniosynostosis with neurological sequelae or risk of neurological sequelae, strip craniectomy can be done. When the optic nerve sheet is measured and is found to be elevated in patients with idiopathic intracranial oh hypertension, optic nerve sheet fenestration can be done. Oh, it's Venous fine. stenting can be done breast in some patients. Breast feet. Then uh, uh, some of the original experiences, uh, some studies that have been done uh, well, 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 which includes uh, 
assessment of intracranial pressure between transcranial ductal ultrasound indices and findings on the preparatory shunts. Uh, correlation of transorbital sonographic optic nerve sheet diameter with intracranial pressure measured intraoperative in children with hydrocephalus and the uh, demonstration of intracranial hypertension in neglected cranial sinus using camera catheter. So for the last one, it demonstrated intracranial for the visual loss in the patient. In conclusion, intracranial pressure monitoring and intracranial pressure directed treatment remain the cornerstone of contemporary neurocritical care and clinical assessment remains fundamental in monitoring intracranial pressure and objective assessment with ventriculostomy drain is most reliable, cost-effective, accurate method of monitoring. But intraperenchymal uh, monitors have gained popularity. However, cost is a problem with them. Uh, wireless data transfer and non-invasive monitoring is the near future trend for intracranial pressure monitoring. Our management may range from conservative to surgical intervention depending on the pathology noted and with the guide of the values of the intracranial pressure. These are references, few of the references. Thank you very much. Wow, that was awesome, Les. That was so good. Wow. Thank you, Dr. Dr. Zukiki wow. and Dr. Wikela for your presentation. Um, at this junction, we'll, um, take, we'll take the comments. Um, well, well, we'll take a um, comment from the senior faculty on board, Professor M.T. Shukumbi, before we take comments and questions from the house. Thank you. Oh, uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Badijo. I actually think we should uh, let the opportunities uh, go around. I, I see that uh, Professor Kalangu is uh, in the audience. I also saw Professor Gusne. Um, I'm delighted that they're able to join us. Uh, and I'm, I'm keen to hear what advice they have for, for our younger colleagues on this presentation. But I think this, this is just, um, this is fascinating. I was so delighted to listen to the two presenters, they worked extremely hard. And despite the teething problems at the beginning, they've taken us through the um, two sub themes of this important subject. I think that um, uh, Dr. Okoye probably thought that we were only interested in risk and propinal pressure, but I think he, he more than made up for it by talking about what ICP is, uh, which is extremely important. Um, this is a very nice start. Uh, you know, no surgery is a long risk, you know, usually. And this, this um, webinar is no exception. And I'm sure that future webinars are going to be a lot better than this. I noticed that there's uh, close to 100 participants. Most of them stayed till the very end. I'm extremely delighted with that. And I congratulate you all for this and wish you the very best in the future. Uh, I think the coverage was extensive and was very good. Um, and uh, I don't wish to go into another lecture. This is your baby, I assure. Uh, I'm impressed. Uh, I would like to ask that Professor Kalan if you say a few words if he's here. Yes, he's here. Yes, please. Hi, hi, Professor Shakumbi. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Do you have any advice or comments for Hello? the presenter? We can, I can hear you, we can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes, we can. Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Oh, perfect, perfect. 
Professor, yeah, thank you can very you much. Uh, thank you very much. Okay, Professor Kumbi, so nice to see you. Still, st still young as usual, huh? <laughs> okay. Well, doesn't feel that way anymore. <laughs> uh, uh, congratulations for the presenters. Uh, they've covered very well this subject. This is so important because it allows, uh, yes, it allows uh, somebody who's treating patients to monitor the intracranial pressure, the way we monitor the uh, blood pressure and so on. Hello? Can you still hear me? Yes, yes please go. Hello? Yes, we can hear you. Just carry on. I'll see if we hear you. Can you still hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Hello? Oh, okay. Okay, you can hear me. Sorry. Yeah. So let, let me, you heard what I said before, isn't it? Excellent. Yeah. So I was saying it's a, it's a, it's a very important uh, area in neurosurgery because you can treat logically uh, a patient when there is raised intracranial pressure or avoid maneuvers which, are, which can increase the intracranial pressure. And uh, instead of just giving monitor, you know, as a blanket and without actually monitoring uh, what, is, uh, what is going on. I have just two questions. Uh, our colleagues were talking about idiopathic raised intracranial pressure. Now, which type of investigations they did to exclude uh, a blockage uh, which could explain raising intracranial pressure. And uh, the second thing is, I know uh, there are some sophisticated equipment now to measure the intracranial pressure. From, for somebody who doesn't have them, maybe it would be very interesting, this one is more a comment, it's very interesting to know that uh, when we started neurosurgery, we didn't have all those machines what we used to do is to use uh, the uh, LP monitoring system uh, and put a catheter into the ventricle and measure uh, the intracranial pressure. Of course, we we're careful by putting a cotton wool on top of the cologne where we could see the CSF to avoid, of course, the infection. And it worked very well, of course, it's more demanding. They are not recording. We have to read it personally. And it can help a lot, at least for the first 24, 48 hours. And uh, we didn't have uh, any, any infection. So my question is to know which investigation were done to exclude, to, 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 to say that this patient had idiopathic uh, intracranial, raised intracranial pressure. Thank you. Dr. Badejo, I think I'll hand it over to you to ask the presenters to respond as required. Thank you, sir. So um, back to Dr. Kiki and Dr. Dr. Bright. Um, there are some comments and uh, questions in the chat box. So we'd just like you to address some of them. And um, if um, other people have questions to you, you can um, signify, you can drop the questions in the chat box or you can um, also raise your hands and we'll uh, be allowed to ask questions. So um, let me go through a few of those comments. Some of them appear to be longer than others. So I'll start with a comment from John Uswa. I hope I pronounced the name properly. So it says, Awesome start to the webinar series. Too many interference from individuals, I agree. Um, I just want to add a few no ifs and no buts. Is this webinar on ICP monitoring in TBI or ICPs as a whole? Um, 
then the comments, like seven or eight comments, there are no controversies in the threshold for race ICP. TBI, the Brain Trauma Foundation, has set guidelines on the upper limit for ICPs and um, stated um, the value. ICP thresholds differ online and upright positions. Understanding this principle helps explain the basis for anti-gravitational and anti-siphon devices in some shunt hardware, e.g. program shunt device, um, sh program shunts for idiopathic intracranial hypertension. There's also a comment that, um, an important comment that ICP is more than just a number and must be correlated with clinical science and radiology. Um, the fourth one in um, IIH consensus definition uses pressures above 25 as diagnostic criteria. The next one was on extra calvarial, calvarial herniation, the importance of distinguishing it from um, other conditions like encephalocele, leptomeningeal cysts, brain um, fungus, cerebri, rare cases of elevated skull fractures. Um, the next one is um, on TBIs, that ICP is more than just a number. Again, um, the spike pattern varies and guides on how to treat and when to treat. Also talked about different wave patterns and the effect of um, the partial pressure of oxygen and um, carbon dioxide on pressure on the cerebral blood flow curve. Um, seventh comment, ICP is a component of multimodality monitoring in TBI. It has advantages and limitations and um, controversies with ICP monitoring in TBI exist in low income countries. Please refer to the best trip study by Chestnuts at all. Um, there are some other comments, but I'll go on to the questions now. Um, there's a question from Professor Yomi Ogu. Nice presentations, kudos to the presenters and organizers. Um, first question is um, to explain the Foster Kennedy syndrome in, su in supratentorial. Okay, yes, the first one is to explain the Foster Kennedy syndrome. The second one, is um, on supratentorial onchal herniation, explain anisocoria and contradistinct third nerve compression from within, from that without, as in diabetic um, third eye. Um, different types of, um, talk about different types of cerebral edema and their management. Um, that would go to the different um, the, the presenters. Please take note. Um, there is, is this a comment um, from Dr. Jaya Abbas, one of the important non-operative options in management of race ICP is controlled hyperventilation. We'd be delighted that the second presenter throws some light on this. Um, also from Dr. Jaya Bass, in patients with raised ICP following severe TBI, cystenostomy alone or adjuvant cystenotomy with decompressive prenectomy is now being proposed as part of treatment and has shown promise. Dr. Gumbade Akindo Sumu um, thank the um, presenters for their Oh, sorry, my connection um, timed out. 
So let's respond to some of the questions. We'll take some more questions and um, comments as we respond to the ones already made. Thank you. Yeah, uh, Dr. Badejo, I don't know if um, uh, maybe I was called Professor Ogun. I don't know if I could make just one comment. Yes, sir. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. Uh, well, just to extend my kudos and congratulations to the presenters, as well as the organizers as well. I'm so excited about this uh, session and I feel so jealous. I mean, uh, if we have so many neurosurgeons, uh, then what are the neurologists doing as well? I think we we'll borrow a lead from this. So thank you for setting up the pace. I think you'll keep it up. <laughs> Kudos to you. <laughs> and a uh, spe special greetings uh, to the great grandfather of uh, neurosurgery in Nigeria and the whole world as well. Thank you for, yeah, for being there at all times. Kudos to you, sir. Thank you. So I think my questions have, have uh, put them on the platform already, just to explain Foster Kennedy, and then the anisocoria when you have the uh, supratentorial oncal anation with compression of the third nerve from without. So you need to explain. I mean, why is the compression affecting just the parasympathetic at the perimeter, and if it's from within, which you have in diabetic third high, which will affect uh, the main third cranial nerve sparing the parasympathetic or the hypothalamus, and then the different types of cerebral edema as well, and keep in view the management. Thank you very much. So very well organized, and kudos to the team and everyone. Well done, sir. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Yami. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. So Dr. Chike and Dr. Bright, over to you. Okay, um, thank you. I'm Dr. Bright online. Thank you to our professors and the organizers. The comments are well noted and the questions I will attempt to answer them in no specific order. The, um, the investigation that was done to make a diagnosis of uh, idiopathic intracranial hypertension um, neuroimaging, such as a, a cranial CT scan uh, done, which when the patient presents with features of a uh, raised intracranial pressure and maybe a, a cranial CT is done and there is no radiological evidence of intracranial pathology, but findings like empty cellar toxica, distension of the optic nerve sheets, flattening of the posterior uh, lobe of the eye, and a, a potential stenosis of the uh, transverse venous sinus, which is better appreciated with an MRI, can be helpful in uh, making a, a possible diagnosis of intra idiopathic intracranial hypertension. However, with invasive intracranial pressure monitoring, the intracranial pressure can be noted and the diagnosis can be uh, pinpoint, pinpointed as, as idiopathic because no particular cause has been associated with it. And it's been found to be common in females obese and especially during their, during their reproductive um, life. Then, um, there was another question on hyperventilation. When the patients uh, present to, when traumatic head injured patient presents, we are not in a hurry to start hyperventilating them because of the problem of hyperventilation, which means when oxygen is given, it's, leads to uh, uh, vasoconstriction. And with prolonged vasoconstriction, there is reduced delivery of oxygen to the brain. And this may worsen the condition of the patient. But when features of risk 
intracranial pressure becomes overt, a controlled hyperventilation can be done for these patients. And the patients are being monitored. So they don't, because the partial pressure of, of uh, uh, CO2 is important in driving uh, respiration in these patients. Um, Others were more of comments. The systemography that was mentioned was more of a comment. Um, okay, the uh, optic nerve sheet diameter, okay, is a comment. It can also be assessed using the uh, cranial uh, CT scan. So the Deep compressive. Yes, well, the, there are some of those questions that we've not yet taken, but um, there's this one on um, Foster Kennedy syndrome, um, also in supratentorial oncolination to explain the nisocoria, contradicting the third cranial nerve compression from outside, from that from within and then also the different types of cerebral edema and their management. Just briefly address some of this. And, and Dr. Uh, the, the first presenter also... talks, sorry, yes, the first yes. presenter talked more about this. Maybe let me allow him before I can make contributions. Oh, sorry, I actually thought it was Dr. Chiki on board. Okay. No, he's Bright. Dr. Dr. Bright, yes. Please. Thank you. Uh, hello. Okay. Um, the question was asked about uh, about uh, Costa Kennedy's uh, initial. Uh, maybe I don't really have that. Uh, Is that syndrome? Yes, yeah, syndrome. Syndrome as distinct from herniation, right? Herniation. Those talking yeah, about yes. Kennedy syndrome, syndrome, and they now yes, talked sir. about the oncal herniation, explanation of the anisocoria. The, probably the, the next question about the pupil, well, about the cranial nerve compression from within and without, as regards the oculomotor nerve, right? And um, the different types of cerebral edema and their management. You can just address whichever one that you can. Okay. Yes, please. Okay. Well, um, the Foster Kennedy syndrome, uh, and I have to consult my uh, literature and then uh, to be able to answer that question very well. I don't know, um, I don't have an idea about it very well, but I have to consult my. Um, then my literature to be able to answer that. Okay, then, uh, let, let me let me just take you through Foster Kennedy. I mean, you cannot be talking yes. of uh, recent intracranial pressure, talking of papillary edema without remembering that there's something called Foster Kennedy syndrome. In Foster okay. Kennedy syndrome, you have an ipsilateral optic nerve tumor or an SOL present on the optic nerve. On that ipsilateral side, there will be evidence of uh, optic atrophy on that ipsilateral side. But because of the space acquiring effect of that lesion, we cause an erased intracranial pressure. So on the contralateral side, you're going to have papillary edema, whereas on the ipsilateral side, you have features of optic atrophy. So that is just to say that for you to make a pronouncement of papillary edema, it needs to be bilateral. I mean, for it to suggest fully raised intracranial pressure. So what I'm seeing in a sense is with Foster Kennedy, on the ipsilateral side, there is optic atrophy because of the mass pressing on the optic nerve, okay? And because of its space acquiring effect, it's causing papillary edema, which will manifest on the contralateral side. So that's Foster Kennedy. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. I really appreciate the help. Yes, and um, also on the different types of um, cerebral edema, you can, you can check that out, but you, um, you, you kind of showed us some examples. There was a slide, a cranial CT scan showing a patient with an intracranial abscess, and there was evidence. If you can just um, project the slide, 
there was evidence of um, edema on that slide. That kind of um, that kind of um, edema that you have you know, um, in an intracranial abscess and intracranial tumor, you know, tumors is actually due to a failure, a breakdown in the blood-brain barrier. That's the physiogenic edema. That's where your um, steroids, you know, the coming. Um, you, I think I saw something on hydrocephalus, I'm not sure, but then, you know, the transependymal page of CSF, that you see on your CT scan or your MRI, that's an example of interstitial edema. The cytotoxic edema we talked about, we talked about, we talked, we talked a lot about um, traumatic brain injury, but we should check up on that. He was also trying to ask you about pupil sparing and non, you know, pupil sparing pregnant palsy. And um, we should know this Foster Kennedy syndrome. He mentioned, you know, when you had um, a patient with an olfactory improved meningioma, you know, medial sphenoid rid meningioma, frontobasal tumors. Um, we should be familiar with this in um, neurosurgery because you encounter um, this as you uh, manage your patients during the course of your career. There are still a few more questions. I'll probably just sorry. take two more Can and I, then... Yeah. Uh, sorry, I mean, just need to make one, two comments. Just, I mean, since it's a mixed audience. And uh, just to emphasize the point I was making about anisocoria, when you have the uh, onchal uh, the way to look at it is when there's the supratentral annulation with onchal annulation, it's going to press on the third cranial nerve from without against the edge of the tentorium cerebelli. And if you remember the third cranial nerve has a specularity, the motor component is within, outside at the perimeter, that's where you have the parasympathetic that subserves your pupil, constrictor uh, pupillae. Uh, the sympathetic to the, to the eye does not go with the third cranial nerve. It goes with the axillary branch of the fifth. So when you have a compression from without, it's going to press the parasympathetic outermost. Okay, and because the sympathetic is unaffected, you have pillary dilatation on that side. Whereas you have on the other side, you have a normal one, that's the anisocoria. Okay, and then contrast the thing that with diabetic third high. In diabetic third high, the compression is from within, the vasa navorum are affected. So you have an infarction starting from within, sparing the parasympathetic outermost. And that's why in a normal, typical diabetic third high, pillary light reflex is still intact except if they have autonomic affectation, which they can now have an adirobotin like pupil. The typical diabetic thought high flurry like reflex is spared because the lesion is from within, okay? And then for the part, uh, cerebral edema, the cytotoxic cerebral edema is the one we commonly have complicating uh, stroke. It's cytotoxic, is intracellular. And it's because when sodium goes into the cell, water goes with it. There must be a sodium potassium ATP to pump water out of the cell because it's an energy dependent uh, mechanism. And of course, because of the either infarction or whatever, there's no energy source. So the cells will swell within. And that will also activate some of the enzymes, the lipases, uh, proteases, and what have you. With calcium, there's homostasis within the cell. So the cell will swell. That doesn't respond to steroids. Mesogenic, yes, there's increased vascular permeability. You find that surrounding the tumors and some lesions and what have you. That, of course, could be steroid responsive. Then you have the, so, um, the hydrostatic, okay, which you have commonly in patients like have hypertensive encephalopathy. Then don't forget that with the intracranial pathology, you can have the syndrome of inappropriate EDA secretion, and you can have hypoosmotic cerebral edema. That's why you avoid hypotonic infusion in them. Then, of course, the interstitial cerebral edema, which will complicate uh, some of the hydrocephalus you have, you have mentioned. I think that is just worthy of us to look into at this session. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Good. Uh, we'll take two more questions and two more comments, and we'll round up this session. Comment question. About 10 years ago, there were multiple studies talking about the compressive apparatomy for raised refractory raised ICP. Any updates on that? Guess meant the compressive craniotomy. Um, there's a question. There's a question. I comment um, no, from Dr. Jayabas Atiro. 
Okay, the compressive laparotomy. laparotomy for yeah. Yes, re for refractory raised intracranial pressure. So his question is, any updates on that? Um, are the presenters familiar with um, the studies? Um, yes, uh, last question um, from Dr. Okay, we've taken a question from Dr. Amta. A triad of anosmia, if uh, that has been addressed already, Foster Kennedy syndrome. Um, which investigations were done to make a diagnosis of idiopathic raised intracranial pressure? Was the brain venogram done? So, just two questions, and um, we can take two comments from um, senior faculty and then we'll round up the session. Thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Bright, um, uh, with regards to the uh, making diagnosis of idiopathic raised intracranial pressure, um, brain venal crown was not done for the patient. Actually, a, a cranial CT was done. Then those findings with the shape of the patient's head, yeah, giving an idea of the sinusitis, so invasive intracranial pressure was uh, requested, which was done, and the values you have found to be higher than normal. About the decompressive laparotomy for refractive raised ICP, um, Chief, I, I don't have uh, information about that. Dr. Amuta will talk to us a little Thank about you. that. We will take two comments and that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, good evening. I'm Dr. Amuta here. Thanks, Dr. Badejo. Actually, that's uh, I, some years ago, about eight years ago, I saw a presentation at Harvard where they discussed uh, uh, the compressive laparotomy as a manager for intractable with the pressure. pressure. And uh, their ideas, the principle they were trying to espouse there was that refractory uh, raised intracranial pressure is a function of the is a vas is a function of uh, vascular pressures within the brain. So what they try to do is that by doing a laparotomy, they reduce intrathoracic and intra-abdominal pressure, thereby reducing uh, pressure on venous return back to the heart. That it helps extensively in uh, patients with raised intracranial pressure. So the procedure they did was uh, they did a laparotomy, but they didn't close it. They left it open for 24 hours and then came back. They left it with um, a sheet, it has an abdominal uh, uh, sheet that they use, but they don't close this thing, leave it open. And then after 24 hours, they come back and close it. So usually they found that in their study, they found that patients they did it to had a better uh, post, you know, outcome and that their intracranial pressure became uh, manageable subsequently. Now, it was mostly used in patients with traumatic brain injury, not for patients with uh, raised ICP due to tumor. And uh, there's been, in fact, the first time it was talked about was I think, 2009, 2010. And as at, I think there's a new study this year talking about it. You can check it on Google Scholar. I think there are multiple articles on it. I just wanted to know if there's any, at the time it was discussed, when I found out about it, it was out there. Most uh, neurosurgeons I spoke with about it felt it was just, you know, it wasn't something to be considered. So I wanted to know if the general consensus thinking about it has evolved or we still think it is uh, too far out there for us to consider as part of management for refractory raised ICP. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Akta. Um, I think Professor Kazadi Kalangu has a question or a comment. Over to you, sir.
Professor Kazadi Kalangu. Thank you very much. I want to just make a comment that uh, uh, it, we shouldn't say it is an idiopathic raise uh, yeah. kind of pressure. And see, yes, can you hear me? Can you hear me? We can hear you so loud and clear. Hello? We can hear you loud and clear, Hello. sir. Hello, sir. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Oh, perfect. If you can hear me, that's perfect. Let me go ahead then. So before we say it is an idiopathic race in traffic, thank you very much. So before we say there is a, re, a idiopathic raise in the pressure, we must do absolutely. Thank you very much. So before, yes, can you hear me? Thank you. What I'm trying to say is before we say there is a raise, idiopathic raise in the pressure, it's important to do a venogram of uh, the sagittal sinus, uh, also the lateral sinuses. Uh, why? Because sometimes stenosis of one of the sinuses can actually cause raised intracranial pressure. It's very important, I mean, to do that. And uh, there is a paper we wrote about that and uh, which, uh, which uh, uh, showed stenosis in a young person uh, who had actually a tumor, which was inside the sagittal sinus which was compressing that. So it's very important to do that. Until you, 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 you have done that, if you haven't done that, it's very difficult to say it is uh, idiopathic raising the kind of pressure. Just a comment, thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Any other comments? Um, we thank the presenters for the very lucid interesting presentation and also the participants and the senior the senior faculty uh, on board professor Shokumbi and other leaders in um, neurosurgery for making this a very interactive session it was um, very interesting um, well for me and i guess um, for a lot of people judging by the comments so now uh, and, um, hand over the rest of the, the closing discussion or comments to the chairman of the YNNF, Professor Ndubisi. Thank you, Professor. Over to you, please. Um, good evening, everybody. I'm really very uh, impressed with the attendance and the quality of presentation comments and the input from our senior colleagues and colleagues. Um, I think this is the way to go. So we just have to look for a way to sustain this while we keep employing our more experienced senior colleagues to keep contributing as well. Um, before we conclude the session, I want to tell you about to invite uh, Professor JKST Amejulu, the NANS president, to make one or two comments. Uh, I want to appeal to Professor Shokunbi to allow one or two comments from uh, Professor JKT Emergen. Thank you. No one can stop, Mr. President. Good evening, sir. <laughs> Good evening, House. Uh, I am JKT Emergen. And uh, you may not imagine the thrill and my joy to have been part of this evening's event. This is the way to go. Why NNF has really come a long way, and we appreciate the efforts of everybody. It is part of the flagships of my own administration, which I took over from my predecessor. And to have brought a faculty this big 
it shows that we are really interested in grooming the younger ones. I thank uh, Dr. Chike Okeke and Bright Wekala for a great job they've done. They've shown the spirit, a positive spirit of learning, and they've shown capacity for docility, trainability. And it means that some of the issues raised, you just tidy it up. You never may know. In October or November, that may be your essay question, maybe in principles or in operative. So don't just let this uh, effort waste. I want to thank uh, Professor Kazadi Kalangu for making our time to join us. Professor Galangu, I appreciate your presence. And uh, Professor Yomi Ogu, wonderful. It's good to have Professor Yomi Ogu. This kind of invitation should always go around in every session we have. We have a lot to gain from everybody. Professor Abdullahi Jimo, our own Jimo, uh, Dr. Uchen no Kafo, who is like a foreign faculty, and the uh, chairman of YNNS, Professor Chicken Dubisi. You are really carrying on the good works of uh, Professor Uche. And I plead with you to just keep the flag flying. And Dr. Kemi Badejo, a fantastic moderator at all times. So I thank all of us, and I wish that we continue to support YNNS and that will support me with surgery in Nigeria. Thank you so much, and God bless. Thank you, sir. Thank you, everyone. I guess that brings us to the end of this um, meeting. See you at the next meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Everyone. Uh, Good night, thank you, Dr. Badejo. Lovely. Well done, everyone. Thank you, Professor. Thank you, Dr. Badejo. Professor Shekun, be very grateful for your oh, attending. It's wonderful. Meeting. It was a pleasure to be here. And I'm glad that uh, Professor Mejulu could uh, be here with us. Wonderful. <laughs> okay, take care. Thank you, sir. God bless you, sir. Oh, take care. And you yeah. too. You too. Take care. Thank you. Bye bye. And thank you to our international attendees. See you thank in the night. Thank you very much. <laughs> I will talk to chat. He will be all here.